Hello and welcome out there, Internet land. Welcome to the Central Texas Mycological Society uh, monthly myco hangout. Tonight, we're going to be here with Sam the Fungi uh, from the Fungi Collective. Is that right, Sam? That's correct. Cool. We're going to be talking about mushroom and waste disposal and, uh, and, and some other fun stuff. So how you doing, Sam? I heard it's your birthday today. Happy birthday. Thank you. My birthday was yesterday, and it is still my birthday because it's a good day. Every day is a good day. Um, I'm Sam the Fungi. I am mycelium in human form. Uh, call myself a mushroom quite often. Uh, my purpose here is to end mycophobia, change mycostigma, and connect people through the power of mycelium. So welcome to the third part of my purpose, connecting through the power of mycelium. Uh, the way I would like to structure this talk is I'm just going to go through a couple cool um, things that mushrooms do regarding breaking down different types of material. And if you have anything that you'd like to add to the conversation, especially regarding experiments you've done, uh, please feel free to raise your hand or make a motion in the camera or something like that. And uh, we could definitely hear what you have to say. Uh, I want this to be more of like a community talk versus just me lecturing. Sweet. So we'll get right into it. Mushrooms are heterotropes, meaning they eat the dead and decaying matter in their environments, which means that a lot of the stuff that we have available to us, wood chips and things like that, we can feed to mushrooms to create more food, to create sustainable um, agricultural solutions, as well as really giving ourselves a fighting chance for uh, saving the world. Uh, I, mycelium is one of the most amazing beings on this planet. I feel like they can help us understand the way we can live more symbiotic in our environment. And the more we study them, the more we study how they eat, and how they communicate with themselves, the more we can learn how to be efficient humans and to be respectful of our environments. Uh, which brings me to another part that I'd like to talk about, which is breath. Um, breath is really important when it comes to life. Everything breathes, everything has a flow, um, an in and out exchange of energy. And with using our breath, we can learn to speak the language of mycelium. And using that, we can create more and more beautiful symbioses in this world. One experience that I have quite often, uh, due to my backyard being completely myceliated, is going outside and just sitting down and being with the mushrooms. Um, you can do this in your backyard. You don't have to have a, a backyard that you've myceliated. They're already there. They're underneath every footstep that we take. They're around us all the time. And all we have to do is think about it, and they'll be there. Um, mycelia. Lost my train. So if you've never gone outside and sat in your garden or sat next to your trees or anything like that, I encourage you to do so and breathe with your trees because they love you and they love to have your presence around. And we need more presence in this world. We need more awareness of what we are, which is an amazing being that can think and has the ability to communicate with its surroundings and create structures and facilitate life. Um, so I ask a question for you all right now. Are you facilitating a life? That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer that unless you want to. Um, the way that, oh, does anybody have anything to say? Yeah, I was kind of given some space for people to, to chime in. I know I take care of trees for a living, so I kind of do it like, not as a big motivation for me to get into that kind of work uh, other than like kind of having an opportunity to get to have a landscaping job when I needed a job but yeah just like being a gardener and taking care of trees and stuff is definitely uh 
it's like a, a way for that i feel like a personal way to give back to like nature and stuff like that so definitely feel where you're coming from there angela are you are you talking about like any kind of life or are we talking about like plants and fungi because i have a kid so i mean they're that goes like there you go in a big way <laughs> it takes up a lot of my energy for sure do y'all walk around me, it gives me a lot of energy too yeah. um can i uh, have a, an administrative note though sneak one in here is that i tried joining this meeting um with the link from the email and it said there was another meeting in progress and then i tried the link that was in the facebook page and and you guys were already started so I, i'm wondering if there might be other people who are trying to get in to the other link and aren't able to i don't know there's like a i don't know i hopefully they'll be able to find us either on the facebook live also or they'll find the link i know the one on the website is good so if was it the email watching, that was wrong did you say it was the email that was wrong yeah okay i'll send out a quick one quick correct email to everyone just in case cool. it could have been like some weird one-off thing yeah zoom does happened. funky things with their links sometimes or sometimes we get them confused as there's different links for different meetings I, I don't know or that something gets changed not quite sure how it works yeah i think this month we had a change in the dates that we were normally we would normally do our meetings at so we had to change the links if i remember correctly thank you for saying that do y'all like to walk yeah. around forests and like <laughs> what kind of experiences do you have where you you take that life you, that you've created and like show what do you show them in nature this is for you angela so <clears throat> oh you want me to answer that yeah if you want you to mean like, <laughs> no pressure though you mean like with my kid that was not a rhetorical question that was that was not a rhetorical question yeah i'm, <laughs> I'm genuinely curious about like what y'all do out in nature oh um <laughs> he's not as into it as i wish he was but uh, we have a farm and so i try to get him out there and um you know like uh there's there's certain things he likes like uh you know certain things he likes to eat from the garden and so if i'm planting that i'll be like oh look and he likes when the baby plants pop up out of the garden he likes to see that so um and he likes bunnies i just found a i just found what i think might be a rabbit den a rabbit warren at, at a, an entrance way to a rabbit hole because it has like I need to look and see if that's what it actually is because there's like bits of rabbit fur all around the outside of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think he might be psyched to see that. Yeah, for sure. I'm I'm kind of psyched to see that too. I would like to see if there's any mycelium growing around the rabbit holes. I've always been curious to see like if other creatures, other mammals like facilitate their own ways of like moving mycelium around because mycelium exists everywhere. So like if they disturb the soil, do they cause mushrooms to fruit there? Ooh. Maybe a point of experiment. Or if they do other things, like maybe it passes through them. Oh yeah. A lot of mammals like to eat mushrooms, like especially deer. Oh my goodness. I had a um, mushroom bed fruiting. Well, we have them fruiting at Circle Acres um, with the micro research station and there's been many occasions where you come over and you see all these uprooted blocks and bits and pieces missing from the mushrooms. And you're like, um, some, some came over and took a bite here. So deer like to eat mushrooms for sure. But I wonder if rabbits do too. I know I've seen squirrels eat them, so I can imagine that a rabbit would eat one if they found one. And, you know, they've done it in, if their mama showed them how in the past, probably. Oh, that's a good tip. 
don't touch the bunnies, just like baby birds that fall out of their nests too. You don't touch them because then they'll smell like humans. Someone on the YouTube said they're transferring mycelium blocks in the garden at, as we speak. Yes. Life every second of the day. Let's go. That's what I'm talking about. I love it. What kind of mushroom blocks? I'm wondering. I don't know. I don't know. It's on a delay, so it'll take a second for them to answer us. But Sweet. Then, yeah. We can swing back around to that. Totally. So what kind of stuff are you doing with mush? What are you doing with uh, mushrooms and waste, Sam the fungi? I'm doing as much as I can. We have a lot of waste and we got a lot of mushrooms and we got a lot of space to combine those two things and see what happens. So I'm working with a couple hemp farms uh, and I'm taking um, some of their waste and I'm creating, uh, I'm seeing what mycelium does to it. Uh, hemp has been shown to really be a great substrate for mycelium but there's not been too much experimentation on it except until recently uh, due to the changing of the laws and a lot of the stigma around cannabis being changed as well. Uh, I know um, Michael Symbio is doing a lot of work uh, with them. He's doing some experiments with growing mushrooms off hemp and he's actually found some really, um, really cool things. William Padella Brown, uh, sorry, I didn't mention his name. I just mentioned his Instagram. Uh, but if you're not following Myco Symbio, you should definitely uh, follow that account. Um, he has been seeing a lot of increase in the vitality of the mycelium after it's being fed to hemp. Uh, it grows a little at a about 20% quicker rate than a normal wood chip spawn would do, and. We're entering into this new age, especially in Texas. We're entering in this, into the summer. Uh, a lot of farms are going to be doing a lot of planting soon, and there's going to be a lot more hemp waste available. So if you know of a hemp farmer near you, maybe reach out and see if you can get your hands on some of their hemp and uh, the hemp stalks and throw it on some mycelium and see what happens. I'm also doing... So my main goal, uh, one of the main goals that I have is to stop all of the mycelial wastes that we have from going into the landfill. So what I'd like to do is take all the mushroom farms in Texas, all their mycelium, instead of going it, it going to the landfill in plastic bags, taking it out of plastic bags and putting it into our yards, into our gardens, into, into the community, and if not into the community, then to the landfill, but not in bags. So maybe we can mycelate the landfill and do something there. Um, that still has a lot of experimentation that needs to be done. Uh, so if anybody has any drive to do some experiments within the landfill space, please reach out because there is a lot of, there is so much space in the mycological realm, in the queendom of fungi for us to study the ways that they can eat what we don't use, uh, especially when it comes to like coffee chaff, uh, coffee chaff in itself is kind of nutrient deficient uh, and it has a lot of other compounds in it. Um, it's the basically coffee chaff is the, the hull of the bean. Uh, after you roast it, the hull falls off and it's a waste product, it goes in the dumpster. It goes great in your garden though, um, as an additive. But if you boil it and strain it, it becomes an excellent medium and substrate for mycelium to start running really voraciously. So you could also reach out to your coffee roasters and get some coffee chaff there. They also have, um, they usually have burlap sacks that they give out with that, uh, or you can ask for burlap sacks. Those are ideal um, places to store your mycelium because that burlap allows it to breathe a little bit and then it can fruit out of the burlap sack without you doing too much extra work. Uh, especially blue oysters. Blue oysters are some of the most aggressive mycelium I've ever seen. <laughs> I planted a bed for a client two weeks ago. Uh, I planted a bed for a client three weeks ago, 
And in that time, he's gotten about 15 pounds of oyster mushrooms out of those blocks uh, that I planted in, the, in his yard. And that was incredibly fast. I, even I wasn't expecting it to be that fast. And I work with them pretty consistently, which goes to show you that fungus will always surprise you in the most beautiful ways. Does anybody have any stories of how they've been surprised by fungus? We have some fruiting blocks that we got uh, through like the the spawn distribution that the the mycological society does. If you're if you're curious about that, anyone who's watching, check it out on our website. There's more info there about how to get connected, where the pickup spots are for that uh, are located, um, and yeah, get yourself some spawn and start experimenting uh, yourself. Um, but yeah, we have some fruiting right now. Rachel, you want to speak out? Yeah, I actually I posted this to the Facebook group earlier today. I had a block of yellow oysters that I thought was completely spent. So I chucked it back in a corner of my yard that is sort of composty and walked back there today. And it's been sitting back there for probably two weeks. No water, no nothing. And it's fruiting beautifully. So I'm, I'm brand new at this. But I am having so much fun. Yes, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and the blocks, boy, they make it easy. I bought kits in the past. Nothing ever happened. But the blocks are great. So thank you, thank you. And the yeah. support from this group is great. Everybody answers questions, and they're friendly, and it's so nice. So thank you all. Yeah, well, we're glad to, that's what we started it up for. So we're, we're glad to have you. Um, and yeah, with once COVID's over, which is we're kind of rounding the corner on that, we'll be able to do a lot more fun stuff together in person and and uh, cultivation classes and and whatnot. Um, so pretty stoked on that. So go go over to the website and become a member to get to get firsthand knowledge and be alerted first before everyone else about what we're doing. Angela, you want to say something? Um, so how do we know if our, like, when or if our membership is, expires? Uh, well, that's actually something we uh, are kind of talking about. Um, in, you know, with COVID, we kind of said that, like, everyone who just pays the dues, they're going to be good on the membership until we start meeting again. But we're actually going to start reaching out and um, and talking to people who, you know, are, you know, just reaching out to memberships in general. Uh, every, all, whoever's a member will be getting like a, an email kind of about this kind of stuff um, saying, you know, we're going to, we'll do some phone banking and call people see like, you know, Hey, you know, we're doing this soon. And, um, you know, come join us. Are you still interested in being a part of the society? And, and we're, we'll figure out the dues and the, yeah, dues will be annual coming uh, starting, I guess, starting this year, but yeah. And Phil, you were also talking about putting together more committees too for different areas of people in the community. Oh yeah, well that's kind of been the whole thing all along. Is like the yeah. society is going to pick up projects and kind of grow little committees based on these needs. But then COVID hit, and so like that kind of really slowed down those kinds of plans. So I'm really looking forward to getting back to all those activities we were planning on doing. But yeah, membership committee is definitely one of those things where we where we could come up with things for you know that are maybe not necessarily like the educational things but like fun things for members to do or like you know uh figure out you know a meetup schedule or something like that hangouts after work or something like that and and then yeah like have a foray committee or something like that or maybe you know it's up to us as members to kind of figure that stuff out so That'd yeah, be really cool to start seeing, or once once everything starts opening up a little bit more, to see regular forays, uh, especially on a weekly basis, because it, the ecology changes so rapidly. Um, I was doing re weekly walks uh, throughout I-35 corridor, and those are a lot to do for one person, but also the changes in the ecology were so profound. There was different mushrooms every time you, we went. Um, and one can only imagine how much I'm, how much like was missed just because 
there wasn't more eyes out there or there wasn't more more of a regular communication and visiting with those different ecologies. And that's how we create new medicines, new things, discoveries is by being out there in nature and by walking in those forests and communicating and just being with the mushrooms and being with the mycelium. Yeah, it's going to be real exciting. Chris, did you raise your hand? Yeah, uh, going back to Sam's question about how mycelium is, uh, like, I don't know, done something that was exciting or, or um, I don't know, unusual. I haven't ever really tried to grow fungi um, until, I mean, honestly, I still haven't really, but I bought some some fungi from the farmer's market. And I think I saw Sam's video on like growing from cardboard, growing fungi from cardboard. And I was like, you know what? I've got these really tough bases of the oyster mushrooms. I'm probably not going to eat all that. So I chopped some of it up and I put it in some cardboard. And then I just put it, I got it damp and I put it under a rug that's in our backyard. Uh, and the rug is always kind of damp, you know? And I pulled up the rug like the other day and that cardboard is just covered in mycelium. Um, and it's like, wow, I hardly did anything except, you know, throw some little bits of, of oyster in there and, uh, and it's already taken off. So yeah, that just really surprised me. So how was the rug? I'm curious. Yeah. I was actually thinking about, um, someone I met, uh, or ran into today was, had just pulled out a bunch of carpet in a house. Um, he was, it was part of the black land conservative project and he was like fixing up all these houses like um and he was just sort of like lamenting like that they're going to be in the landfill for like thousands and thousands of years millions maybe and i was thinking like oh man the oysters eat those <laughs> but it's def- uh, they're, the mycelium is definitely growing into the rug too i'm not sure that i'm seeing the rug degrade significantly but there's definitely attachments going into the rug so um yeah Mm -hmm. yeah you could we could totally inoculate some rugs that way that would be so sweet like a sandwich layer of like rug mycelium rug mycelium yeah we haven't tried yeah that would be a good myco research project for sure I mean, we have all pretty much all the technical skills to do that. And with all the fundraising going on with the people's donations for the 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 block distribution, is we have a cool name for that? I don't I don't know. Um mostly just mushroom block giveaway, but we've also just called it my uh, mycology in the garden. Um, but it's not really there's not really an official name for it. Do we need and the- to- set up a committee for that in the beginning uh, but, oh, there was ahead, in the beginning that was called the micro revolution or at least we were getting donations under that title so <laughs> i i really liked that i was like oh micro revolution that's true that's what it is we're using and we're creating more life it's a revolution <laughs> so cool. yeah rachel um question because i'm so new at this So I got a couple blocks back in January and I watched the videos and I put them in a flower pot and I forgot them. And then we had the weather in February and in March, they just, and I've no, I've told Angel this already. They just like blew up with mushrooms. It was wonderful. But I'm wondering now that it's starting to get hot, how, how does the summer work? I mean, do I need to start bringing these flower pots in the house or are they okay out in the shade or... What do you what do you do? Because I'm I'm growing them because I'm eat I'm like cooking them with asparagus and all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. So I'm growing them to eat. Yeah, uh, yeah, they should be fine in the shade. If on the particularly dry days, you might want to water them or kind of keep them watered regular regularly. And I guess if you have access to rainwater, that would be best to water them with that. Um, but yeah, say- as long as they got substrate. They should be fruiting. Angel, you were saying something? Yeah, I was going to say you could put your coffee grinds in there, you know, just put like nitrogen rich, you know, because the oysters, they actually, um, this is something too that like uh, people are researching as like a biocontrol. 
because they actually search out nematodes in the soil and consume them when they're in nitrogen lacking environments. And so they kind of strangle them and then absorb their nitrogen. And so, you know, there's good and bad nematodes. And so scientists are trying to figure out like, oh, can we stop the bad nematodes by using these oyster blocks? And they haven't found anything significant, but anyways, like the point is they need nitrogen. And so coffee grinds are high in nitrogen. And so as Sam was saying, like they love to be put next to oyster mycelium. And um, I've done, I've been doing that in my garden too. I just um, do a little, you know, coffee shops will have like, um, especially in Austin where we have the um, recycling, the compost recycling, most coffee shops, you just go grab the, go in the bin, the green bin and just grab bags of, of grinds out. That's what I do for all my garden beds. That's and sweet. Compost. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty easy get here. Like you can also ask like your local coffee shop too to save, but um, it's nice that there's a separate bin and most of the time it's just coffee grinds in that big, in that green bin. Well, this batch that I'm growing now from the blocks I got just a few days ago, I got some of those cloth grow bags. Oh and yeah. I just put a couple inches of like leaves and twigs in the bottom and then I put the block and then I kind of wrap loosely around it, just some sort of strawish grass from Perfect. the weather in February from my yard. And yeah. it seems to be working pretty well, but I think the coffee grounds, now would I just like sprinkle them over or mix them in the bottom part or what do you uh, Yeah, just kind of sprinkle them in, um, you know, uh, try to mix them in as good as you can. But yeah, kind of just thinking about compost, like, you know, you need the, about 30% nitrogen, 70% of the um, sort of brown matter, carbon matter, which is like wood chips, straw, something that's already kind of past its, like it's released all of its nutrient or it's a uh, sort of like water and has dried out. Is the block still in, in the whole form, Rachel, or did you break it up? No, I didn't break it up because, like I said, I'm really, really new and I don't know what I'm doing. So uh, I just have whole blocks that are fruiting all over themselves. <laughs> nice. Uh, when the blocks start to get really hard, um, they basically form a skin around themselves and they won't continue to seek out other food sources and they'll just kind of like collapse in themselves. So when you break them up, you open that inner mycelium, which is still really full of life and vigor and you allow it to like continue to eat its environment. Um, so with that one, putting the, li oh. the twigs and the leaves and everything, that's perfect. And if you break up that block even a little bit, it'll okay. allow those mycelium to keep, uh, keep running. And then you'll get more and more fruits continuously as it just, as it continues to eat. Okay, thank you, thank you. This is so helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for growing mushrooms. <laughs> Um, a couple of questions from YouTube. Um, there, Shaman K asked, um, how many members are there? There's around 200 um, with family memberships and, and all the single memberships. Um, and like I said, though, we need to go through and make sure people are still interested and, and all that kind of stuff. So we might lose some people in that process, but we are, we've actually grown a lot through the pandemic. Um, so really excited to keep doing stuff in person because I think that'll just help us grow quicker. Um, and then an another question that I think will s spur off some, some uh, discussion is what is the difference or pros and cons of getting a block versus a, a mushroom kit? Uh, and I guess it's kind of we've been using a little bit of jargon uh, talking about this stuff and not really giving definitions uh, for it all so the 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 blocks that we're getting are basically a kit but the kit is the mushroom kits are kind of uh grown specifically for the purpose of like selling out uh, to people to fruit them in their home whereas like the these are are from a farm where they already started fruiting the blocks um and then they were like past their prime for you know the commodity mushroom 
crop that they were growing. So, you know, they were getting rid of them. And so kind of what we've been doing is making relationships with these farms around here and getting that, you know, basically keep taking their waste product away from them you know, for them because they would have to just pay, pay to dump it anyway. Um, and so we're taking it away and it kind of works out in a symbiotic relationship for us. And we, yeah. you know, they let us um, raise funds and stuff as, as we give it away to people. But so I guess that's a really long way of saying that there kind of isn't a difference between a kit and a block, except that the block is maybe easier because it's already started fruiting. And I think, you know, maybe that kind of gives, you know, us a framework for kind of talking about that. Like, what do y'all, th what do you think about that, Sam? Yeah, the blocks, getting them as a waste product versus buying plastic that is specifically created for you to fruit at home. Uh, to me, there's, there's a stark difference. Uh, one of them is meant for the trash. The other one is meant as a commodity for, for, for like you to fruit mushrooms in your house. So if you take trash and you fruit mushrooms from it, I mean, that, that's achieving the purpose right there. And that's decreasing the, the amount of mycelium that's going in the landfill, which is phenomenal. Yeah, and I was going to add, too, to what um, Bill was saying, too, about it going in the waste. Like in Austin, there still isn't um, commercial composting so all of that organic matter which is rich in you know nitrogen carbon it ends up going into the waste stream and going in with all the other plastic and garbage that people throw out and creating the methane problem that you know we probably all know about hear about a lot which is like much even more dangerous for the environment than you know carbon I think it's like 10 times worse. Um, and so wherever we can, like try to reduce and take like this highly beneficial organic matter out of the waste and, you know, create food from it essentially. And also help our soil build soil, which is super important as well. Um, it's a very happy place for us all to be <laughs> yeah, for sure <laughs> and just a tiny 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 little little thing that we can do <laughs> there's another question from the chat that i think would be some good good conversation uh sam what are your thoughts on sterilization of bulk substrates When it comes to outdoor fruiting, I don't sterilize any of my substrates. Um, I feel that the mycelium is going to, if given the right conditions, the, especially with the moisture, the moisture being the most important part in my eyes, is it allows them to just continue to grow. I haven't had too much contamination issues um, I mean, obviously, it's outside, so there's trichoderma already in the soil. There's all, all the contaminants that you would get in a lab or you would get in when uh, you're fruiting those indoors. When they're outdoors, it's all naturally exposed to that, so it kind of develops its own resiliency through that. Um, yeah, that reminds me, too, about the, uh, the, the study that shows that just the mushrooms grown outdoors, like they're 400 times more... Um, full of vitamin D. And so, you know, trying to like create, mimic what is already happening in nature outdoors is going to be healthier for all of us, um, nu nutrition wise. Absolutely. And they get also exposed to all sorts of other minerals and things that are in, in your soil um, that can be both good and bad. Uh, if your soil is really like toxic, if it's like an, in, uh, an industrial park that you're making this mushroom bed in, the fruits from it might not be so beneficial for your health. Um, mushrooms hyperaccumulate what's in their environment, so they can get uh, they can get pretty toxic. To be honest, uh, mushrooms can eat up um, something that they do consume, at least in a laboratory setting, is uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which is a byproduct of oil production uh, so mushrooms can eat that but the mushrooms that fruit from that substrate are going to contain some of the material that they weren't able to deal with or work out 
uh, and make bioavailable or change into a different form. And that can be bad for us. So putting your mushroom beds or picking your mushrooms uh, with that awareness is really key to getting the best mushrooms for your body. And Angela. So don't eat the ones that you're using for bioremediation. Is that what you're saying? Yes, for sure. Don't <laughs> use those. Don't eat the mushrooms that are growing in a dump. Yeah. <laughs> now, what you could do is take those mushrooms that are growing in the dump and put them on some cardboard that you have just laying around. Uh, instead of sending that cardboard off to be recycled, you could take it and feed it to mushrooms. Uh, cardboard is an, a really, really simple substrate to grow mushrooms on. Um, basically, all you do is just take cardboard, put it in some water, take it out of the water, squeeze it a slight bit, put the mycelium in the cardboard and roll it up and put that in an airtight container and it'll eat that cardboard probably within two weeks. Uh, blue oysters, like within two weeks, like I did one in February and by March 14th, uh, I did it at the end of February and by March 14th, it had already started to, it actually broke through the bag and started fruiting. Um, it was sitting on um, a counter that I had and it was like, sport in my house and everything i was like dang it i should have paid more attention to you the spores in your house are no fun they're hard to get rid of and they kind of give you a little bit of like um i guess uh distress above of your nasal cavities and sinus cavities they can get kind of like allergies feeling so if um are there any substrates you would recommend avoiding because they might contain toxic stuff that you don't want to eat? Yeah, there is actually not all cardboard is made the same. I'm very really glad you brought that up. Uh, American-made cardboard has very specific requirements in terms of what chemicals are allowed to be in it and the manufacturing process of that cardboard. Um, there are some cardboards that are made in China that have some not so great elements uh, as well as some carcinogens so that's something to be aware of um, amazon boxes are great substrates for mycelium uh, and we're in a, we live in a society that has a lot of amazon boxes available um, i often walk the neighborhood and, <laughs> and pick out from people's recycling their amazon boxes so that i can lay them in my garden and put some mycelium on top cover it with wood chips uh, and then create a little mu mushroom garden does anybody have anything to add about what mushrooms shouldn't eat or what you shouldn't feed to mushrooms if you're planning on eating the fruits? Um, I guess I was going to ask you a little bit about like what kind of, what substrates are you using? Because I know you want to avoid like using pine shavings or something like that because like they have, um, you know, they're, the aromatics in the pine wood are antifungal. So like the mushrooms that you grow on them are not going to do well at all if they grow and if they if you do get mushrooms from them i've heard they also like taste bad like they take taste like pine or something like that too so um what what substrates are you using and are you like um are you hydrating them at all and how do you do that if you do the main substrate that i use right now are are the wood chips and the only way i hydrate them is just by uh putting the hose on with a if you can put a filter on it, that's cool. But I just use regular tap water. Um, just hydrate them, put the mushrooms down, kind of mix it in on one level, and then add more non-hydrated wood chips on top and then kind of wet that and allow that to settle in. The other substrate that I'm using is cardboard. That's the other main one that I use. Uh, just because it's such, there's so much of it, it's such a free resource for you to get. You can just walk around your neighborhood and pick up enough, m enough food for the mycelium to get, shoot, anywhere from like one pound to 30 pounds of mushrooms, depending on how you create your, your vehicle for um, wow. consolidation. Hold on, Rachel's showing us her uh, mushroom block. Oh yeah, so beautiful. Georgia. Would you mind say, yeah, saying something, Rachel's? Yeah. I just went out and, and cut these, harvested these 
Um, cause I realized if I waited till tomorrow, they'd probably be, you know, twice this size. <laughs> they grow so fast. Or the slugs this would is, get to them. This is a yeah. cool thing. So yeah. <laughs> nice. Those they are the look, perfect time to harvest. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go they ahead. Look, they look perfect. Um, so yeah, I was going to just kind of summarize. You were saying you had, you use, uh, the cardboard and wood chips, those are your main substrates that you use. Mm -hmm. and you'd like to use hemp more if you yeah. can. Yeah, I'm starting to experiment with some hemp right now. Um, I'm partnered with a local farm, Tejas Hemp, out of Dripping Springs. Uh, they've produced uh, quite a phenomenal hemp flower in this last run. And they have a lot of hemp stock, and they're just kind of giving it to farmers. And I was like, well... I could take some of that too and see what the mushrooms do with it. And they're like, if you can feed all this to mushrooms, that'd be super dope. And then you could just give us some fruits and that we'd call it even. And I was like, sweet, let's go. <laughs> oh, wow. Cause that's pretty cheap uh, trade then. Cause like you could totally grow a lot of mushrooms on that. Like I know people, yeah, it's like an agricultural waste product. And that's like one thing that draw, drew me to mushroom production in the first place is you know i mean there is like the aspect of like plastic waste involved but um the fact that most of it comes from you know you can grow them on waste products that normally go into compost so it's like you can kind of one get that material ready for compost a little bit quicker and two make some food out of it in the process so like that's something that i always thought was really cool um and then yeah hemp is going to be a good one yeah, what is um what is the does hemp have a lot of carbon as well? Like once it's a byproduct. Yeah, it has a. Those stalks can they're like they're lignin. It's pure lignin, so okay. you can just. It, it has everything pretty much that it needs, and I I feel like it does contain a different mineral profile. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't tasted any mushrooms that have been grown off of hemp as a sole substrate. Um, so that's my next step is to see what kind of taste difference that I can detect. And then the step beyond that would be to send it to a laboratory and have that backed up by a laboratory analysis of everything that's in it. Uh, Cause that would be really cool. Um, Bird mentioned something in the chat just now is the cannabis version of hemp, the same as far as being a substrate. Uh, so cannabis is a family um, hemp and marijuana are both in that family. Uh, hemp is currently legal in all 50 states, and it can be um, commercially cultivated without uh, too much issues. You just have to get a permit uh, versus the marijuana, which is more of a um, it's more of a drug. Uh, it's like a an effect on your endocannabinoid, endocannabinoid system is a lot higher, uh, so it is considered an um, I consider it an al altered state when you smoke marijuana versus when you smoke hemp um, or when you consume hemp. There's so many different things that hemp can be made out of. It's a textile. You can make shirts out of it. I have a hat made of hemp. Um, I want to get some shoes made out of hemp. Pretty much everything that you can make out of plastic, you can make with hemp. And that, that's kind of the line that we want to go down. Because um, if we're making it out of hemp, uh, we can feed it to mushrooms when we're done with it. And then it goes back and it continues in a cycle of it stays in the soil. Then it comes back out. Um, oh, would the mushrooms contain cannabinoids? That is the number one question that I currently have. I don't know, uh, but it would be really cool if they did because uh, they do hyper accumulate within their environment. So if you feed them something that's high in cannabinoids, the potential that they would uptake those cannabinoids and be, uh, make them bioavailable is there. Um, they might change it into something else. Um, they might metabolize it and uh, make it not bioavailable to us. Um, they may they might enjoy it themselves. Uh, but yeah, that is that's a good question, and that's something that I would really like to to know more about. Is does when you feed mycelium cannabis that contains high cannabinoids, does it contain, does it uptake within the fruits of the mushrooms? So if anybody wants to, to help that out and do your own experiments at home, please let me know. <laughs> Can that be done? It has to be done with like a, 
it, uh, like a nutrition analysis, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like what are there uh, companies, I guess, that specialize in that that you you know about that? Um, or is that something you're still exploring? It's definitely something I'm still exploring. Um, I know it's sending it to a laboratory to test it for that for heavy metals and for like other contaminants is pretty uh, regular. That's something that you can do easily, uh, but testing it, doing that test, I'm not sure. Yeah. Like maybe since it's like you're looking just for cannabinoids, like maybe that's just like one test that you can run to. I've seen uh, Michael Symb Symbio run tests for uh, terpenes on mushrooms, and there were several terpenes that came up, but they have never been classified before. So there are, there are terpenes that exist in mushrooms that don't exist uh, everywhere else, um, and we don't know what they are. We don't know what they do. But if yeah. you've ever smelt mushrooms, you, you can kind of, I don't know, I feel like I can smell something. What were you going to say? Hello, the oh, gold oysters. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, a terpene is a, is a chemical name. I, I don't really, I'm not a chemist, so I don't really know, but it's like a specific shape of chemical. I think, I think it's probably the best way to describe it on a very like layman's terms sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, William Padilla Brown is doing a lot of that kind of research, just like looking for, looking at what's in the cultivated cordyceps that they, that, you know, that he grows and, um, and comparing it to like live ones and just kind of doing that sort of analysis uh, on the different strains that they are cultivating. Um, so yeah, it seems like figuring out, figuring out a way to align on with those kinds of projects might make the research a little bit cheaper. Um, someone yeah. asked, Bart Shroomson asked, Sam, are you uh, supplementing your hemp substrate? Like, are you adding any like nitrogen to it or? No, I, I just want to feed it just pure hemp and mycelium. So the, I guess the only supplementation that I'm using is I, I'm using blocks. So I am using like a, a nutrified substrate that's already been myceliated, meaning it's already been eaten up by the, stru the root structure of the mushroom. And I'm introducing that to hemp. Um, with the hemp being, it's like 50-50, like a 1-1, one, one, uh, one part hemp, one part uh, spawn. block. Yeah, spawn. So I think you probably could, if you were like using hemp as a farming substrate, I think you might even want to supplement it because it's probably a lot like using sawdust, except for I think mm -hmm. potentially one of the reasons why it people are seeing faster growth on it. It's just it's a little bit simpler of a, of like a, of a wood, if you will, because it's not as dense as like, especially wood chips or something like that. Yeah. So that might be one reason why people are seeing it. But I think like, cause I know you can get fruits off of just like a, just like a straight sawdust bag, but you'll get better fruits if you add a little bit of nitrogen to it. So I think it would probably be a similar thing um, for the hemp. Um, and I, I can also imagine that there are people who have already been doing like pretty extensive research on farming hemp and, and farming mushroom farming with hemp as you know hemp waste as a substrate. It's really more of a matter of like, is it available in like a sufficient supply for like someone to actually have like their farm base their that off of their main substrate. Yeah, I think now we're finally entering into that realm of like there's going to be enough hemp that's around that anybody could reach out to a local hemp farm or um, people are starting to do a lot of hydroponic hemp uh, they're growing it specifically for like smokable flour um, smokable hemp flour Hilarious. so yeah so you could reach out to those people too and get their waste because they I mean it's hydroponic so they're not putting it back in the soil at all it's all water systems so the the structure of hemp is a lot looser, I would say, than wood for, as well. Like going on what you said, Phil, um, it takes three months for hemp a hemp stalk to grow up to be twice as tall as I am, and it takes 
a tree many years to do the same thing, depending on the type of tree. So the availability of hemp versus hardwood chips is going to be a lot more accessible and a lot more sustainable for mushroom cultivation in the future, or at least that's what I perceive. Because, I mean, trees take so long to grow. We're cutting them down at quite an alarming rate. Um, and kind of turning it into like a, like a kind of chipping it up, I guess, like into like a substrate, like, is that process, like, what do you think about that process? Like, is that something that, um, because it seems like a lot of farms, like they're just buying the like wood, the wood pellets, because it's so easily available, you know, and it's like a quick way to get even like sterile, um, a sterile substrate. Um, I, and that's always like a challenge, like taking a byproduct that's like not like you have to add like more industrial processes, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, to get that opportunity for someone to like turn turn hemp into pellets. Hey, ding ding ding, new business. Yo, they would smell pretty good too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's like, that's a really good point because the sterility of the substrate is really important when it comes to industrial mushroom cultivation. Mm -hmm. So like the way I'm doing it right now, I mean, it's, it's very simple. I'm just like doing it all by hand and it works, but I'm not being very picky with like wanting to get like hundreds of pounds of spawn inoculated or like introduced hemp to hundreds of pounds of spawn and have that potentially be contaminated that would be quite terrible if you were a commercial farm but the wood pellets a lot of the farms use those fuel pellets from uh, different paper companies because they just it, yeah. they create it so easily it's just like it's like a built-in process yeah Hmm. Now there's all those grills. Oh my god! Whew. You guys familiar with these like crazy barbecue grills? They're like Wi-Fi connected that take pellets. I learned about it this summer what? when I was Surrey of all places. I was like, "What? You spent twelve hundred dollars on this grill that takes pills? No, that takes <laughs> pell pellets. pills." Tell it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's connected to the internet. Are you crazy? <laughs> That's incredible. Why, why does it need to be connected to the internet? I know, right? I still don't understand. I didn't Tell even you, try to so understand. Can, no, no, no. I'm going to stand up for this because I was trying to do something similar for <laughs> my uh, mushroom uh, my mushroom pasteurizer when I was trying to build like a – so. I wanted you, that thing has got to be on for like eight hours a day. And it's a similar thing when you're trying to smoke sure, something, it's sure. got to get to a temperature. So it's got to be on for a long amount of time. So you want to be able to leave, you know, to at least like go back inside, do maybe do some other things, prep the rest of your meal or something like that. And so like, you know, I'm all for that certain yeah. levels of connectivity. Like, I don't think, you know, let me get on my little high horse. I don't think you need like an <laughs> internet connected refrigerator, but there are some things that make sense. Like, yeah, have like a distance capability and like just so you can get a notification to be like, oh, your temperature chuck, is good. That chuck just right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I got I got a I got a nice little uh, wireless thermometer, meat thermometer for Christmas. It's been pretty oh, dope. Wow. Oh, we nice. just grill pills, you guys. It's the new, <laughs> you know, instead of all the pills, the political pills, you could just grill pill yeah. and talk about <laughs> grilling. That's the best one. <laughs> the best one. we just did that <laughs> yeah rachel what's you got a question yeah so now you've got me thinking about you know taking down trees my pomegranate which died to the ground it's coming back from the roots but there's a lot of dead wood if i can hook up with somebody who has a chipper this is good substrate yes yeah 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 totally you said your pomegranate didn't make it through the storm. It didn't make it. But it's coming, it's, coming, either. it's coming back from the roots, though. Oh, it's Beautiful. coming from the roots. Yeah, yeah. yeah stay with uh, me. Are you in Austin? I like, am. Probably. South First and Stastny, roughly. 
and you can check your big brush day because i i'm just well i mean i would like to grind all my stuff down i don't have a wood chipper i wish i did but um, we just had brush pickup like a month ago i have so many piles of brush for pickup day. have you all heard of chip drop mm -hmm. yeah the website where you can sign up to get uh arborists drop a few pile of wood chips in front of your house yes yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard it is pretty successful um maybe not really great in austin specific i've had better luck just flagging down like tree companies and being mm -hmm. like hey when you're done doing that tree over there like when i see him working like drop it off here it's just less money they have to pay you know, when they drop everything off at the waste. Um, and it, if you have a truck, you can get free mulch from Bitters in San Antonio. Bitters brush dump. Like anytime you can get free mulch there. But I wonder, I wonder if it would be uh, too diverse because you're not exactly sure what you're getting. So with that, I actually get some chips from the Comal County tree recycling. Um, mm -hmm. You just pull up with a truck. They have a, like, right. like a, they have a dunk. Um, they have a tractor. They just like dump it into your dump bed for you. And also in whatever trailer you want to bring, but it does have both deciduous and coniferous trees. They have some cedar in there oh. too. So right. with, with that mix, um, the mushrooms still fruit from it. Uh, but going back to like growing mushrooms on pine, like Philip was saying, it can develop a certain taste to it depending on what kind of ratios are in there. So it's basically like your best judgment. Like when you smell it, does it smell like dirt and wood or does it smell like super like cedary with those uh, those terpenes that are in the cedar? But there are quite a so, few so, places so it could be a, it could be a cedar fever mushroom. <laughs> 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 I mean, like, you know how they have the, the little concoctions against cedar fever? A little tincture that you need. It's not a little tincture, yeah. <laughs> tincture <little> mushroom. mushroom. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so there are definitely plenty of places to get substrates and get the food for the mushrooms uh, that are no cost to you it's just your time um, and then you can get the mycelium again like very low cost to you donation based uh, through the through ctms if you want to check it out become a member uh, you'll get access to a bunch of free spawn as well as um, forays that we do member only forays and during those forays we give out blocks as well so definitely become a member uh, highly recommend that. That I'm leading. Yes, that's so exciting. <laughs> I wish I could be there. I'm gonna be there in spirit. Okay, we are gonna like search out the spring polypore. I don't know. I, there, there's. I was hoping Ruby Belitz would be making it an appearance, oh. but I think we just need that r more rain. Well, somebody posted some Ruby Belitz earlier today on Facebook. Oh yeah. Oh. Is it in Central Texas? Uh, let me look. Hold on. Yeah, I haven't seen any yet, but there's mycelium everywhere, so it doesn't matter. Like, we're going to find it. Yeah, we're, it's just like... We're going to fungi no matter what. <laughs> we just need that rain. We need to do some rain dances or something. Yeah. Get that moisture back over here. Yeah. I also want to mention, too... Um, uh, I don't know if y'all, if you're all are on the Facebook group, Kathy from, she's part of the Texas meetup, Texas mushroom meetup. She's been working on making the Texas star mushroom, the official mushroom of Texas, even though, you know, whatever Lone Star bullshit, like we don't like that, <laughs> but we don't, we, we like, we like the part of the Texas star as our history as part of our you know representation of the state whatever yeah anyways but there's a bill in the senate in the house and i i'm gonna see her tomorrow so you know maybe we can help her out if she needs any help like kind of you know juicing it 
maybe uh, sending some postcards or something to people. Um, phone calls. Phone yeah. Calls. So maybe we can all start change our photos, detect the star mushrooms. I don't know. Like do, do something fun like that. But just keep a lookout. I think that it goes up for vote in May, but I think we can create some noise around around it before then. Um, so yeah, so yeah, it's uh, let's see. So the session ends May 29th. So I, I haven't spent too much time in the legislature, but I think that it's just a matter of like pressure and then whatever crazy shit that, you know, the Texas legislature wants to focus on. So I don't know, how can we make this uh, relevant? Like straight up, like if we make enough phone calls to those offices, they're, they are so preoccupied with other things that if a, they get a bunch of phone calls about this mushroom bill, they would probably be like, okay, fine. Yeah, whatever. Like, yeah, uh, they have other things that I, like, as I do a lot, I've been following this session more closely than I have in the past. Cause I'm doing a lot of stuff with my union around mm -hmm. legislative things and yeah, they're worried about other things right now. So we, if they, but if they get a bunch of noise, like it'll be an easy win for them because, like, I guarantee they don't care about it. So yeah, it'd be easy thing for them to be like, well, people are annoying me about it. Let's just do this. It's Texas Star is so important. Yeah. It's only yeah. in Central Texas, and it needs to be representing our state symbolically. Would would we be the first people to have a state mushroom? I don't um, know. No, I think there's a lot of states that have an official state mushroom. Mm. So, yeah. But we have a unique one. That's true. Yeah. Jeremy, did you find where those uh, red uh, ruby bowl eats were? I did not. I'm sorry. Ah, shucks. That's okay. We'll have to keep our eyes peeled extra now. Yeah. Turn on the red <laughs> cones. Turn on the red cones, everyone. I need to get out and go look. Um, yeah, and um, I'm not sure if they'll be able to make it. They were gonna, sh they were gonna pop in. Um, we shared it on our social media earlier today, but on May 1st, we're also doing a benefit um, pre uh, performance and workshop with the Octopus Project, which is a um, Austin band. I don't know. Does anybody is anybody familiar with them? No. I'll drop a, a link in the yeah. Chat. So they've been around since '99, and they're um, they're kind of an experimental electronic kind of band. And for the last year, they have been um, collecting mushroom biodata. So at the beginning of COVID, they were actually stuck in Peru. And this is sort of where this project started. And they wanted to like collect a lot of the data there. Um, but then they ended up coming back uh, once COVID sort of shut everything down. And we've been working with, um, you know, members of the leadership team, we've been working with them to kind of create like a biodiverse collection of musical, um, musical bio data. Um, and so what they've been doing is sampling the electrical patterns using software um, and hardware. There's like a couple of, um, and, and there's a few like electronic musicians that have been doing this like since the 80s. Like one of the guys that I've been following, his name is Michael Prime. Um, I think he did some like music for uh, um, her, like, why can't I always forget his name? He's the British guy, Mel Drake. Oh, I screwed up his name. Merlin Sheldrake. Merlin Sheldrake. <laughs> so dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> Merlin Sheldrake. Oh! <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, that was bad. Uh, so yeah, so for the promotion of his book, they, they made some music based um, where they collected the sound coming from the book that was inoculated with oyster mushrooms and they made oh, a song cool. from it. 
And so this is the same sort of concept, um, but it's like a bunch of different kinds of mushrooms. And we were so lucky to find some morels in Central Texas. And I have a little bit of footage if you guys want to see some of it to just get a little taste. I can share my screen. Please. Okay, hold on. Okay, let me um, share my screen. Here we go. All right, so this is us hanging out with, so first, let me just say like, I found one morel and I was like, okay, the one single morel, we're gonna go sample it, we're gonna collect the bio data. So I called up Yvonne and Josh, which is like, um, the, um, uh, they're in the band and it's like, okay, let's go do this. Let's go collect the data. And, um, and so then I was like, I have to use the restroom. I was like, they were like, you know, making all this music in the forest with these mushrooms. And I'm like, oh, I've got to go to the bathroom. So I go to the bathroom then I find a huge patch of a bunch more. So we ended up having like enough for like a lovely meal afterwards. And they were able to, as you can see here, like collect sound from um, kind of like one and the other one. To, and, you know, the morel mushroom, it has a symbiotic relationship with the juniper tree. And so it's it was one that we really wanted to kind of hear what it sounded like. Um, so once they collect the like biorhythm, which is kind of like a waveform, like a heartbeat almost, you know, everything has a biorhythm. Um, they can assign it to a, um, a MIDI sample. And so this is just a little bit of a preview. I've got a few more that that was a pretty short clip. The screen's a little dirty. You can't really see too much of the waveform there. Um, but here's a few other clips. Hopefully I'm not talking in this. So yeah, so anyway, so they've composed um, a bunch of songs that are um, based on, um, that are assigned to like these different mushrooms and they're gonna be sharing it with their fans and CTMS fans on May 1st. And everybody's invited, well, the tickets will go on sale on the 15th of April. And so um, there's also a workshop if you want to like dig into like the technical aspect, if you're into like making music. Um, so yeah, so th there's that too. Yeah, I'm pretty excited for that. Watching those mushrooms play those synthesizers is pretty cool. Yeah, pretty neat. I think it's incredible that we can we can like listen to their sounds they make like we're listening to their electrical bio rhythms like the same ones that exist within us also exist within them too mm -hmm. yeah it's just one other one other way we can hear or we can uh, have a sensory connection to nature you know uh, yeah it's pretty interesting it would be really cool like if you could actually if you were actually hearing exactly what they were doing but all it's really doing is telling like a synthesizer when to play which i still think is really cool because i mean that's all what humans do nowadays basically is tell a synthesizer when to play um but yeah it's like yeah it would be really level. cool to take it to that next level of like getting a mushroom to sing i'm yeah. sure you could do that somehow 
Yeah, I think thing. Even, like kind of like knowing how to treat it to like get it to sing a certain sort of way. And it's almost like it's like a it's like a step beyond DNA. Like we're so excited to like just identify like a species or like know the tree of life. And it's like the next level is sort of like being able to like hear something and know what it needs, like know its communication language, because we just don't have that ability like animals and other creatures. They have that sensibility and we just don't have it. It's like muted in our you know in our uh our biology and so being able to, hey ivana and josh how's we it going just, y'all we were just talking about mushroom well. synthesizers <laughs> <laughs> good to see you. good to see y'all we're just Maiko hanging out talking about um uh you know different ways of recycling uh, mycelium and Sam was getting into the into like hemp the using hemp as a substrate oh, wow. yeah and so yeah we were just talking a little bit about this big um, uh, project big announcement that we shared today with everyone um, so yeah so yeah um, I shared a few little clips uh, from the foray, little morale foray that we <laughs> went out on. Um, so yeah, do you all have some, have anything that you want to share with everyone that's here tonight? Um, uh, I don't know. I was like, does anybody have any questions about anything? I do. How do you do it? <laughs> and like, how do you get the sound into the computer? What's the What's the chain of chords? <laughs> um, there, there's like a little box. Um, it's like a little white box, and it's called a MIDI biosonification device. Um, wow. And like one, one end goes into the computer via USB, and then uh, one cable goes out of the box, and it has kind of um, two, two clips on it that you can clip onto a plant or even just hold yourself. So, Whoa. And yeah, just whatever the information that the clamps are giving to the box and the box turns that into MIDI data, which then goes into the computer and we can turn it into music, essentially. Oh, and are the clamps like a positive and negative? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so they, they, cool. basically, they pick up electrical impulses from mm -hmm. any living thing. And uh, oh. with those impulses, we are able to basically assign like assign a sound for mm -hmm. it's, it's like assigning a keyboard for the mushroom to play and so we we put like a, a bank of sounds um oh. to, to these impulses and then music comes from that and it's usually really ambient and meditative and beautiful sometimes it's a little crazy I, I think mushrooms tend to make more chaotic like there's a lot more information uh, that comes from mushrooms um, as opposed to just regular plants or trees um, wow. in, in our experience anyway do they do does each species seem to have its own song or like its own pattern uh, everything's within kind of, the mushroom world. Um, they're they're all pretty different. Uh, I haven't noticed it enough to see if like you know uh, like yellow oysters are like all the same or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems yeah. to be like each each thing we do like does they all it's very you can tell like they're all different. So, but, sometimes uh, there's a, a a discernible pattern mm -hmm. that that emerges if we record. We try to record for up to you know 20 minutes to see if if we can see a pattern in the wave and um, sometimes uh, we'll see patterns that look like um, what starts out as really low bass tones and then you can see the sound moving up and up and up to the higher notes and then there's a drop off or just like a period of silence and then the bass notes start again and then a general, you know, ascension to the high notes, and then a drop off. So sometimes you can actually see this um, very 
kind of a constant and discernible pattern that emerges. So if I understand what you're saying, the mushroom starts on the low end of the keyboard and plays an arpeggio like up the keyboard? Sometimes. Sometimes. That's pretty Sometimes. cool. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, that's really awesome. Um, and that's like a pretty regular pattern too. So like, uh, is, was it fast enough to jam with? You know, or... <laughs> it's weird. Like it won't, it's not like, uh, it's not the same every time. Like if, it, even when the same mushroom, like in the same recording, like it'll, it'll be moving up. Like it'll take like 30 seconds to move up. And then the next time it'll take five seconds to move up or like, it's strange. Like it's not, it's doing kind of the same motions, but it's mm -hmm. not exactly the same each time. It's it's pretty weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you were telling me too that it reacts differently to things like moisture, like environmental changes, mm -hmm. so like wind or moisture or um, like dryness. Even you know, like that. Even, would... even our touch. Like if I were to touch a plant or a mushroom, as we would we were recording, it would pick up my impulses and change the, the pattern that we get. Great, well, thanks you all for sharing. I'm sure. gonna throw up the, um, I think I have it on my screen, um, the event poster, so everyone can kind of see more details. Um, yeah, and we'll be announcing, you know, we'll be sending out more info, but um, yeah, like April, uh, May, Saturday, May 1st. So um, it'll be here before we know it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that flyer is so cool. Like that is, oh, that is so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, great work. I love it so much. Yeah, so we're excited and um, yeah, we're kind of wrapping things up a little bit. Um, and we just ended our chat about mycelial love. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, does anybody else have um, any other announcements or? thoughts um a little bit more on the using fungi for waste disposal we are put some mycelium oyster mycelium on uh some like really ripped up pants and old clothes and stuff like that and they've been really growing really well on, on it's been pretty pretty cool to see. i love that i really want to do this carpet experiment too now that we were talking about the rug and i think i might talk talk to you uh, do you all know thor he's in uh i ran into him today and he was ripping out carpet and he was it just frustrated him so much and i was like okay we need to put my seal on, <laughs> <laughs> on this problem <laughs> calm it down um, but yeah, Thor, I'm trying to remember the name of his, uh, band. He's in the music. Thor, Thor and Friends. Thor and Is it Thor and Friends? Yeah. yeah. Thor and Friends. Yeah. 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 He's great. Um, so yeah, so we can. I have one more question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> About the music process. Um, when when the bio like feedback kind of when when the vibes are being picked up um do you have to not hold on to the probes so that your own energy doesn't get picked up yeah um like do you have to set them up so that they're touching it but yeah not? And, and so what we have these uh alligator clips and um I prefer not to clamp them onto the mushroom. It just right. destroys the tissue mm -hmm. and, and uh, we end up losing sound pretty quickly as it just like clamps down. So uh, there are some, there's like these rubber parts, um, the ends of the clamps or the, the base of the clamps have like a little rubber end. So 
I just touch the clamps to the mushroom and mm -hmm. make sure that I am not touching the metal clamp mm -hmm. or the mushroom. So it is, I have, do have to be really careful to yeah. not get my own, you know, not touch anything, not touch the mushroom and not touch the clamp. Your frequencies aren't picked up. Yeah. 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 That is so cool. I really respect what you guys are doing. Uh, awesome. You. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so, something, something new we've been trying just uh, because of this project is not only trying to get the mushroom information to control the music, but to control visual signals Ooh. as well. And so That's we're, cool. we're putting video together mm -hmm. and um, programming certain parameters so that the, the signal, the variations from the mushrooms will be controlling um, like different patterns in the video, uh, different colors to come in and out. Uh, so this is something new we've been playing around with and, and it's- That's it's fantastic. Looking, looking pretty yeah, good to see it. On, on yeah. Saturday, May 1st. <laughs> <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> That's so That's cool. so, yeah. <laughs> I really wonder, uh, and did y'all try and get them, to the mushrooms to like jam with each other at all? Or it's like, I don't even know if that would be uh, possible. Or... We only have one box yeah. to like yeah. get the sound right now. So it's unfortunately only like one, one at a time, but, but. uh but we have played um, some like, you know, like an oyster mushroom, like played a, a track of an oyster mushroom and then recorded live um a different kind mm -hmm. of mushroom like a chest chestnut mushroom uh -huh. um i haven't really you know not enough we haven't played around with it enough to notice that they interact but uh no we, we've kind of played around with blending the sounds mm -hmm. definitely after the fact after the yeah fact. yeah that's so well, cool though i'm really stoked yeah, yeah. It's just the beginning of learning their language. Right. Yeah. <laughs> speaking, speaking my stelia. Uh -huh. <laughs> Do you all use cultivated blocks for your, um, for most of the fruits that you listen to or do you, other than the morels? Um, no. Uh, well, I guess where we have two right now yeah. that we've been using. Um, and then, but just like stuff we buy even, at the store. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sweet. I, I would be curious to see what a, like a, a uh, known contaminated or like wild strain of oyster mushrooms mm. yeah. sound like compared to like a cultivated strain yeah. if there's a difference yeah yeah absolutely. i'm curious about that or kind of one that's grown outdoors in the sun with all the like natural uh sort of bio right you know, mm. compared to like a controlled environment uh-huh mm -hmm. yeah chris did you have something to say yeah, this actually kind of brought me to something that I've been thinking about with all the uh, the blocks that are going out. Um, I've been thinking about kind of, you know, how we have these domesticated honeybees that we brought over from Europe, and then they escape into the wild, and then um, they're out competing some of our native bees. And I kind of started thinking, mm. are we potentially like putting out all these spores from cultivated varieties that are going to be like you know uh dominating our nearby woodland areas and and are they going to outcompete potentially some of our native you know fungi is that something that Interesting people thought. thought about yeah the, 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 any it's kind of cultivation i guess yeah <laughs> yeah it's definitely something that i've thought about a lot um being as like I'm creating so many outdoor beds, like literally that's like one of the things spreading spores, right? So the the question remains to be seen. Um, blue oysters are very very aggressive as a, as a mycelial species, and they do outcompete uh, host fungus that exists in the wood chips that I get um, because I've gotten wood chips that have been uh, they have other mycelium in it, and then I put the blue oyster mycelium, and it eradicates it it takes it over uh, i don't know if it i don't know if it eradicates it but i know it takes it over and it makes it to where uh, it's less visible visible um and if there were any fruits that were to come of that they don't really show up um so, so i did at the radical mycology convergence a couple years ago at this point someone did present on a paper that they were writing 
uh, about this precise issue, uh, and they had found that uh, golden oysters actually kind of have been shown to be escaping from people's farms and taking up residence out, you know, in in the in wild spaces, kind of in an invasive capacity. Um, and then I also have seen another a similar thing with some like mycorrhizal species too, and also like kind of it's been a while since I read this paper, but kind of how like sometimes these invasive, you know, invasive fungi, invasive mycorrhizal species will take up hosting on native species or, you know, uh, uh, invasives that they used to associate with in the past or, and, you know, so also native fungi doing that with invasive species, helping those invasive species, you know, tree species like take root in, in, uh, in forests and whatnot. So it's kind of like, it is a very complex dynamic and it is something that we should be wary of, especially with you know, things that we know aren't cultivated here. And that's like another really important thing or for reason why we need to be like kind of collecting species from around here and getting them into the cultivation stream. Because if, you know, someone is cultivating a local oyster strain that was like harvested from the creek, then, you know, it's yeah. a clone of that you know, genetics that already exists in the environment. So you're not introducing anything new. So doing something like that mm -hmm. is important. Um, but I, I guess also it's maybe a little, a little more of an open question about whether they are out competing other native fungi. I could see some of being out competed and others doing just fine. So, yeah. so Hi-Fi Hi does do a uh, local strain. Their pearl oysters are from a local source. I believe they harvest them, harvested that original culture from around Austin and they uh, did the work and uh, I think that Corey did enough work to be able to get it to like finally be able to produce like commercially viable fruit. Cause that's the, that's the main thing with getting these fruits is like you clone them, but sometimes like running out the mycelium and getting it clean kind of loses that essence of like that fruit. Um, and it doesn't necessarily get the same beauty that it had uh, when you cloned it. Yeah. It's like the doge meme where like the big strong one and then the little yeah. one crying. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need that meme everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I uh, good one. I actually gave them um a little sliver and they told me that it was um colonized or I forget the last update, but it was I think that they're able to use it, but I gave them a little sliver of a local uh lion's mane that I foraged. What? Yes, that's so cool. Everybody can have local lion's mane strain. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited. <laughs> so hopefully it'll make us smarter, so we spread the right spores. I think I think it's on the block song, the right spores. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be interested to see what what kind of the like what its compounds are compared to the Arisinius. Um, cause is, is it, um, Harrisonium Americanium? I don't know. We should have given Alan a little sliver too. Um, where was it harvested? Secrets. <laughs> 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 That's what this forum is for. <laughs> well, I was, no, no. wasn't in Austin city limits proper. It was in Cedar Creek. Okay. Oh. And it was okay. on a joke. Ooh. It was on a, a post oak. Old oh, post. Yeah. They like old <laughs> oak trees. Yeah. The deader the better. But yeah, <laughs> um, I want to send to Alan next year. Because it was the second year that I harvested it. The same spot. Oh, nice. So it's reoccurring. Yeah. Very cool. So yeah, I'm excited to hear back about the Texas morel. Cause I sort of, I just was like, oh, whatever. I'm not too good with Latin. Like I, uh, especially with everything changing so rapidly. And so he's like, um, this variety that you hashtagged the mushroom with is only found in Europe. <laughs> and so, okay, well maybe I should send you some Texas morels. <laughs> so yeah, so he's gonna sequence the one that I sent him. Cool. Since he's Prince Harry lookalike now. That was so funny. <laughs> that was That's hilarious. The, yeah. 
Um, the mycological meme groups go hard on Facebook. If y'all aren't a part of them yet, I highly recommend joining them. It is hilarious every day. Y'all gotta, y'all gotta text them to me because I'm not on Facebook, and then I can use them on the Twitter. Just uh, repost, repost. Um, I want to answer this question in the chat before we get too far away from it, or before we wrap up tonight. I just want to make sure to get to it. Harper plants, you do not want to eat those mushrooms grown on the carpet. Um, they were asking if you would want to eat the mushrooms grown on the carpet or the the rugs uh, for remediation and it's until we know you know I don't know off the top of my head like what is in the carpets themselves and there could be stuff that the mushrooms can't aren't able to break down and so they just like incorporate it into their body instead and so then um, so then yeah it uh, would not be good for you to eat that and it might actually like concentrate those toxins in the mushroom itself and then it would be like having a higher dose if you just like ate the 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 carpet itself um which obviously no one's gonna do hopefully there's jokes there just kidding yeah i thought about that right when i was saying it i could have said the other one (laughs) writing itself (laughs) you gotta keep it uh pg so we don't get actually we're not monetized on on here so just go wild everybody (laughs) (laughs) fuck you youtube (laughs) fuck you google (laughs) um just uh i'll put this out there to the youtube uh crowd since there's a little bit of delay do you have any more questions out there Uh, yeah, somebody right? asked. Somebody asked the question. Uh, they have dog vomit invading their garden. Uh, dog vomit slime mold. The dreaded slime mold. Um, slime mold eats your mushrooms. Mushrooms don't like slime mold. Mu- uh, slime mold likes mushrooms, uh, but in the bad way, in the parasitic way. So if you get uh, slime mold in your garden, um, what the way I've dealt with it is just removing it. Um, it usually just grows really surfacely. And you can like remove an inch of whatever soil or um, like mine, it's very much in my wood chips. So just removing that section of wood chips and getting it out of there, uh, usually as a whole unit that you can like immediately put into a bag and seal is ideal because the spores of that are absolutely ridiculous. If you simply breathe on it, if you drop a water, like one drop of water will spread thousands of spores. If you breathe on it, you'll spread hundreds of spores. So it's very sensitive. So just removing it from your garden is kind of a good thing. What do you all think about slime mold? I love it. I love what it does for subway systems. (laughs) It's super smart. But um, I don't don't remove it from my garden just because I'm like, it's so smart. (laughs) Finding it's building weight. soil. It's yeah, I'm like food web. That's that's why we leave it in our garden. But I can see if you're like wanting more mushrooms that you would want to keep it away from your mycelium, just as like you would keep try to keep bugs away from your vegetables. So the benefit, right. um, Bill. What is the benefits of like what is it? It's building the soil as well. It's just kind of like breaking yeah. things down. And- yeah, it breaks the mycelium down and poops it out stuff. So it's good for bacteria and keeps the cycle of nutrients flowing so yeah yeah it seems like when your soil is like pretty rough like where the balance isn't right is where i see it so it's kind of like an indicator too like oopsie i don't like it's it's sort of primal soil Hmm. is that how that's how i see it it's like i kind of know little like rough patches in my garden where i need to maybe kind of help out the soil a little more i don't know maybe i know it definitely we have like broken up mycelial blocks all over the backyard so i usually see it growing off of the mycelium first and maybe it moves around a little bit um ian on youtube asked have anybody found any morels in texas yet um, I want to ask where in Texas are you looking? Like you can give be pretty general 
obviously don't dox yourself. Um, but I haven't found any this year. Angel has had luck. Yeah. Do you have any tips for anybody? Yeah, like I think it's pretty much over, but um, I've seen a few posts recently on the Texas Mushroom ID group and also there's like another group, I think even on our CTMS group, the Central Texas Mycology Facebook group, a few people have found uh, morels, kind of older ones that are kind of past their prime in the Austin, Central Texas area. But um, I thought with this last rain, there might be, and the temperatures like stayed lower. And so morels like, you know, ground temps like around 60 degrees. And so, yeah, so um, I thought there might be another flush, but, um, but yeah, I haven't seen any when I've been out. And it seems like everything's just kind of moving up. Like I've even seen people posting morels in like Pennsylvania in the sort of. They're in North Texas. So you might still, the temp, it's a little bit cooler up there just in general. So you, depending if maybe if we do get some rain this next week, uh, maybe yeah. it's always worth looking, you know, what's wrong with taking a hike, right? Yeah. Really kind of the next thing are the Ruby Belites and then, when it starts to really feel like a sauna outside and we get some real crazy kind of cats and dogs type rain, we get chanterelles, but that's usually there's flooding and it's not a good thing when we get chanterelles. So I always remind myself that mushrooms are a, an expression of disturbance in the force. Mm. So yeah i wouldn't mind getting some chanterelle rains <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a good r&b song chanto rains <laughs> yeah we'll use uh some uh sample data from the chanterelles to make it there you yeah. go i would definitely like to drop some some uh soprano note on that <laughs> we, so, another question for sure um do you know if anybody's trying anything i'm just not keeping up with like the growing out world uh are people trying to anything besides plastic to grow stuff out in as their attempts to do that yeah, so there's so many places that are using glass now. So you can do, um, like, they're doing a lot of, uh, I've seen a lot of farms specifically in China or in Asia that have, they have these tubes and they're just like glass tubes with a one sealed end and one open end that are about like that big. And they just fruit mushrooms out one side. They, can, they stuff it in the tube, they cover it, they put it in a dark container or they, a dark warehouse usually and then they move it to fruiting conditions open the end off and then they just produce fruits until it, it grows smaller than the container and then they dump it out and refill it and start again mm. and then you can also field trip to china yeah i'm in for that learn from them there are so many ways that we cultivate fungus that it's like it's so detrimental. Like we're creating so such plastic waste, like just for food, which is like the the what we're creating, what the life we're cultivating in that plastic is uh, is beautiful. It is like so beneficial to this planet. But the way that we're doing it feels like such a. It's like going against the grain of the mushroom. Like it doesn't. It's not a. It's not a symbiotic like thing where we're creating trash from this this beautiful life source that really doesn't need to have trash involved with it mm -hmm. like five gallon buckets we can create um I, you did a video on that within the mycology in the garden uh, the five gallon bucket tech of just filling spawn wood chips in a five gallon bucket with holes in it and that's that's good enough to let the mushrooms fruit out of that and you get 20 30 pounds through its lifetime 
And all you have to do is just minimal care, really just like go out, look at it, mist it every once in a while and tell it you love it. And Isn't that really toxic though? Isn't it what? super toxic to grow it that way? Because it's gonna, it's gonna absorb more of those plastic toxins. I mean, it's grown in plastic bags. There's way more toxins in plastic than P BPA. That's just the one that they isolated and and you know made demonized. But there's a so whole bunch of other ones. So yeah, I worry about that real quick. So yeah. there's uh, H E B has a lot of food grade um, containers that they are uh, use for like their frostings and their right. icing and all that stuff. So you can go get those food grade plastic containers. Um, and use those to grow your mushrooms out of. You don't even have to poke holes if you don't want to. Just I personally you know, don't trust. I don't trust food grade plastic. Sweet. That's a, that's a I, 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 to each their own. But you know what right. I'm saying? It's food grade yeah. to, to their to their standards. If if you're eating oyster mushrooms, you're eating it from a, a plastic. Uh, the mycelium was in right. plastic bags. So the the idea from the is, grocery store, yeah. Right, right. So the idea is changing the culture <laughs> behind yeah. the way that we grow mushrooms, and not necessarily like, like, yeah. We just need to change the culture like completely. What about what about um, cutting a wine bottle? There you go. And growing them in wine bottles. That you know. Work. Totally. There's a lot of wine bottles all over the place. <laughs> What'd you say, mm -hmm. Angel? Is it Carlo Rossi wine bottle? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any of those in my house, but <laughs> that does seem like a better size. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm suggesting you drink a whole gallon. <laughs> No. <laughs> I'm too old for that at this point. <laughs> I okay, the mushroom thanks. substrate with it. Um, I think one of the main reasons why, like, the plastic is such a standard right now is it's like it's you know relatively cheap for businesses to get into, and like, I mean, that's what drives most people to do, you know, anything, especially grow mushroom, uh, you know trying to grow tons and tons of mushrooms you know it's because it's a commodity that they're trying to sell you know to in a market as opposed to like growing it because people need food like it's just a different logic that goes into it uh and it's kind of just baked into our society right now so yeah you talk about like needing to drastically change something like yeah. the lobby is so strong you know like i'm if you're from austin you know about the plastic bag ban ban which is just sort of, I mean, I see so many of the like thicker plastic bags, just not, reusable bags that are not reused, you know, <laughs> that just like stack up, which is, you know, they're not floating around like American Beauty in the wind, but they're also, they're still sitting and not being decomposed. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like we got a call to action now. We need to find a way to produce mushrooms in a in a sustainable, not plastic grown way. The straw bale technique was one that um, I was kind of hesitant about until two weeks ago when it exploded. <laughs> Actually, I made a bunch of jerky, which I wish I could share with you all right now because it is awesome. I have like tons of it. Um. But we, one of the demos we did for the Tofka, the Texas Organic Gardener Farmer Conference was the straw bale technique. And I thought, it, like I saw a lot of Northern climates, like people doing it in Northern climates. And I was thinking, eh, I don't know if this is gonna work in Texas. And it did. Like there was one other girl that watched our video and she shared her posts like about her straw bale fruiting. And then mined it a week later. And that's the exciting part of like this whole project too, of like online education is seeing everyone trying these different techniques too. And yeah, so straw bale and uh, Callahan's is where I bought, I, I know you're in San Antonio area, but if you're in Austin, Callahan's, they claim that their 
straw that they sell is pesticide or uh, pesticide herbicide free and they're twelve dollar big bales and so um you know like you can use one block and get like multiply like you know have like extend you know sort of multiply your oyster block by like fourfold that's what it felt like <laughs> the last run week. that run that mycelium out yeah i was, I was running it hard that's my cool. dehydrator was anyway <laughs> <laughs> like oh this thing's the fan is gonna break my dehydrator did break the other day oh no yeah it sucked like, New man. Present. <laughs> yeah. present for me like when i think when i turned 30 johnny got me all these prices right type gifts and i was like oh my god like i feel like i'm on the prices right i got a waffle maker a dehydrator like all these great appliances so memorable but yeah we'll have to get you a new dehydrator for your birthday <laughs> sweet i'm gonna build a solar dehydrator too because the I mean, I'm still getting lion's mane fruits right now, like in the beds that are fully exposed. If it gets like water, they are, they're producing lion's mane. Um, insane, insane. <laughs> what would Bob Barker say about this? Anyway, He would say spay and neuter. <laughs> 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 yeah, he probably would be worried about the invasive aspect of it. He's like, you guys gonna we? I'm, you saw what I, you spent my whole life trying to keep cats from doing that, and you're doing it with mushrooms now. <laughs> Gosh. So, do we have any more questions? YouTube is talking about how cute Sam is, like Jason Momoa. Oh, you are. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. I love you. <laughs> version of Jason Momoa. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, no more questions rolling in. Okay, if you liked what you saw tonight and you want to help support what we're doing, go over to centraltexasmycology.org and become a member or donate to the uh, donate to the Myco Revolution. Michael Revolution, let's go. <laughs> Our, the Spawn Distribution Project uh, to keep uh, mushroom spawn out of the landfill. Um, follow us on the social medias. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, leave a comment if you want to. And share this with your friends. And yeah, thanks for hanging out with us tonight, everybody. Hi. Happy birthday, Sam. Think can anything? we grab that so I can send you a dehydrator? I will. Solar <laughs> one. If you need anything, reach out, reach up, reach down, and reach in. I love you. Let's go. Michael Revolution time. <laughs> <laughs>